you. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Samit Ghoshal. So I think he, we always uh, listen to him in all the uh, best possible conferences everywhere. He's a consulting physician, diabetologist from Kolkata, highly qualified diabetologist and endocrinologist. He has graduated from Calcutta National Medical College and post graduated from Chennai in internal medicine. So he's practicing in, in his own clinic at Nightingale Hospital, Kolkata. He's always have a special interest in diabetes and endocrinology. And we are listening to him for last almost seven, eight, eight, 10 years in all the uh, big conferences. And definitely, uh, so even if we are late, but it's pleasure, always pleasure to listen to Dr. Samit every time. So over to Dr. Samit. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Thanks, uh, thanks, Manoj, and thanks, Puvi, for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, are my slides visible now? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thank you, Rajesh, for your introduction. Uh, it's a cricket season. I'm feeling like the night watchman, so I'll try to play as cautiously as possible. It's a, it's a very tricky topic, COVID times, and how to deal with insulin. Whenever it's an acute scenario, you always remember a good old friend insulin. I mean, it's not acute and a chronic scenario, then we start bringing in CVOTs. That's the latest fashion, I think. So I'll go into a uh, bit of the thing on diabetes and COVID before we right away delving into the insulin, when, which, and how. Uh, these are a few backgrounds. Uh, let's remember there's a lot of things which has been going on and a lot of scaremongering on diabetes and COVID. Uh, the direct correlation is not as strong, but uh, if you have uncontrolled diabetes and hyperglycemia in the backdrop, and you develop COVID, especially a severe COVID and you get admitted, then obviously there's a threefold higher mortality. But doesn't mean that you have a well-controlled diabetes and you contract COVID, you have a much higher risk compared to your non-diabetic counterpart. That part is still uh, quite wishy-washy, but definitely if you do not have uh, very good, good, good uh, glucose control, you might land up in trouble if you develop severe COVID. And uh, that's obviously uh, amplified by the fact that we see the majority, you know, about 88% of the patients who were hospitalized, that we have the prevalence data, had diabetes in the background. And in the backdrop of uncontrolled diabetes, near one in 10 diabetic uh, patients with COVID uh, normally dies in seven days, in contrast to the non-diabetic counterpart. So this is something we need to keep in the back of our mind. And then there is a circular uh, you know, relationship between the two. Obviously, a COVID, uh, there is a question mark, no direct relationship, but there seems to be a, some data accumulating that COVID directly can impact uh, and damage beta cells. And thereby, by infection per se, as well as by damage to the beta cells, it can aggravate hyperglycemia. And hyperglycemia, by aggravating inflammatory response, can augment the COVID-related inflammatory damage. So they complement each other, uh, and especially in a hospitalized environment where you know, there are many other factors which are waiting for the opportunity to join in and worsen your inflammatory response. So we need to be very careful uh, because we remember that most of the COVID related management are symptomatic and supportive. But what we can do is a lot in the diabetic patients by taking care of the hyperglycemia. So first thing, we need good glycemic control that will reduce the risk of infection in those who are not yet infected and also will reduce the risk of morbidity and mortality in those who are infected. And for that, we need frequent monitoring. And not only in those who are admitted, but even those who are uh, at home and do not have good glucose control. And in this scenario, until, until uh, the, the pandemic ends, needs frequent monitoring and titration at a much faster pace than what we are normally used to. We need to stabilize the backdrop comorbidities because those are the ones which increases the risk of fatality or in the backdrop of severe COVID. So we need to reinforce lifestyle modification. It's most likely that patients are going to listen to us uh, in this backdrop when, when they, they are really scared of what might happen. They, it also opens up, opens up a window of opportunity for us to, to have more dialogue and they'll be more receptive uh, as far as listening to you. And we can bring in a lot of changes in, in, in the uh, you know, exercise and nutrition part of a patient. Not necessarily everything depends on pharmacotherapy. Now let's right, go, right away go into insulin. It's not that there is no of oral drugs. Yes, it, those who are well controlled on oral drugs, we just uh, need to keep them on and not switch them over to insulin. But those uh, situations where we require insulin, where we must remember that in, in the outdoor uh, patients who are not in, in good control with multiple oral drugs, we need to put our foot down and stress on initiating insulin in them. And they might be more receptive in this environment compared to uh, the non-COVID non uh, scenario where they used to say, give us a little bit more time. However, in hospital is an easy scenario, but we need to remember that 
uh, we need to be very aggressive in the hospital in managing hyperglycemia. And very aggressive doesn't mean being so aggressive as to induce recurrent hypoglycemia, because then that uh, takes away all the advantages that we have as far as managing hyperglycemia is concerned. This is a beautiful overview of uh, which was published in Lancet of what we should keep in the back of our mind and not specifics, but an overview. As far as the outpatient pair, uh, department is concerned, the main objective is prevention of infections in diabetes. And that can be done by sensitization of the patients. Optimal metabolic control can be done choosing the current therapy and optimizing the current therapy. It doesn't mean you just discontinue everything and put everyone on insulin, but you can optimize. If they're very close to target, you just need to increase the dose of one of the OHS, do it, but, but increase the monitoring because they might decompensate very fast in this, uh, in this current scenario. We also, also have the advantage of telemedicine. A lot of us are using and connecting to our patients through telemedicine. So probably it's time to increase the frequency of uh, communication with our patients, unlike uh, in, in the past when we used to give them a longer uh, you know, follow-up uh, plan. Intensive care and patients who are admitted here, are, are, from the diabetes perspective, the main thing is to prevent acute hyperglycemia and related complications like DK or HHS. That's the first thing, adequate hydration, good insulin therapy and prevention of infection are the three most important pillars of managing our patients uh, in, in, uh, who, are, who are admitted. Although uh, this particular guideline seems to be extremely aggressive from the glucose point of view, as a rule of thumb, I think we should remember 100 to 180, uh, any, any glucose value uh, of patients who are admitted is a very good target uh, if you can achieve that. Remember in COVID background, there are a lot of hydrogenic factors which can actually aggravate the sugars. And even this liberal values, as I told you, 100 to 180 might be very difficult to attain. So uh, the outdoor management, if the patients are not controlled on maximized oral drugs, initiate basal, be very aggressive. It's not working go for basal plus and premix. Rarely we do need basal bolus in the outpatient out management, but if required, this is the time we need to be aggressive and even consider basal bolus in there. So for indoor management, first is monitoring, detection of unknown diabetes, which a lot of them will be caught up in this scenario. HB1C becomes a good, uh, important tool in doing that. Managing uh, non-diabetic hyperglycemia, even their insulin has a very important role to play. And then initiating or up titrating the dose of insulin, and then definitely uh, tackling steroid in, in, uh, induced hyperglycemia. So I'll be just uh, you know, stressing more on this part because this is a very tricky part as far as the hy managing hyperglycemia is concerned. Now, this is the Government of India, Ministry of Health guidelines, which are available with us, uh, just there online, anyone can approach uh, and, and see what's written out there. And step one, anyone who is getting admitted, whether known diabetes or not, needs a random glucose to, uh, plasma glucose to be done. And if that is high, then we need to perform pre-meal and uh, or post-meal. I think pre-meal is more important in the hospital scenario. Two hours post-meal is extremely difficult to time. So pre-meals are easier to time uh, uh, in, in the hospital scenario. At least a four to five uh, point SMBG needs to be done in most of the patients who are at least detected with hyperglycemia and or diabetes. Next day morning, you can get an HB1C done. I do not know why next day morning, this is random test. If you have a high C CBG, you can immediately get it done. Uh, uh, this is a random test. Anyways, for those who are detected, step four and five tells you that you need to decide on how frequently the glucose needs to be monitored. This, I think, needs to be individualized. The pharmacotherapy part is, is this, I think, is too high a target. They have set more than 250 use of random sugar. I think they should be 200 according to all uh, international guidelines. Pre meal, again, more than 150. I don't know where these values come from, but, uh, anyways. Uh, this is a uh, local protocol you can always develop in your hospital. Even for the insulin part, you see it's a flat insulin, which is NPH uh, in those who are on steroid. And this is the part which I'll be just stressing upon before I end. Remember, steroids definitely increase glucose, but there are different types of steroids, just like there are different types of insulin. There are short-acting steroids, intermediate-acting steroids, and long-acting steroids. And so we have short-acting insulin, intermediate-acting insulin, and long-acting insulin. So we need to tailor this accordingly. For generalized guidelines of insulin therapy, I think this, this guideline does an excellent job. For majority of the patients admitted to the hospital, there is no substitute but giving them a basal bolus therapy. If they are not on steroids, they do not have significant baseline hyperglycemia. You know, at least 0.5 to 0.6 units per kg body weight is the total daily dose of insulin split into 50-50, 50% basal, and the rest 50% split into the three times meal, and then give them correctional boluses to take care of the additional spikes post-meal. This 
requires a little bit of a pragmatic approach because I think those nuances are absent from this particular uh, government guidelines. And those, those are the slides I'll be showing. You have beautiful data from our, our recommendation from Nikhil Tandon and their group. And as I was telling you, uh, around 120 to 180 is a very good uh, you know, you know, target that we can achieve. It's achievable and I think it's safe in most patients who are admitted. Uh, also, let us remember that most of the patients will be requiring a total daily dose of insulin in excess of 0.5 uh, units per kg body weight because of other factors joining in. And per uh, 50 milligrams per deciliter or 40 or 30 or 20, depending upon the baseline requirement, uh, this is the correction factor. So you need to give one unit for, for example, every 50 milligrams per deciliter above target in those who are requiring less than 0.5 units per kg body weight. And they give us a specific indication that if you're giving a basal bolus therapy and uh, the if the daily dose requirement of insulin is going beyond two units per kg per day, then that's probably, there's no need of further uptight patient. We can straight away go into IV uh, insulin. Remember, we don't have much time. This is an acute stage in the hospital and, and it's also a matter of life and death. This is the part I'll end with. Please remember, it's a type of steroid we use and that is many, very much simplified by the guidelines because most of the COVID guidelines are asking us to use dexamethasone nowadays. But uh, depending upon the steroid use, if you use hydrocortisone, it is short acting, so they have a short spike. Within six hours, it dies down. So it's better to use rapid acting insulin out here to take care of the spike. So if you're giving hydro hydrocortisone twice daily, the two shots of short acting insulin are going to do a good job. Yeah, uh, basal can be added to take care of the fasting sugar, which will be required in patients who are, have a backdrop diabetes. And remember, basal, a little dose of basal is always required to cut down the risk of DKA. So it's not that you use a prandial insulin and don't give a basal. It complements them. But the main requirement for cutting down the steroid-induced hyperglycemia using a short-acting uh, steroid is a short-acting insulin. Intermittent acting steroids like prednisolone and methanprednisolone will have a duration of action with 12 to 16 hours. You need intermediate acting insulin. Maybe NPH will be a good choice here. If you give it twice daily, sometimes methanprednisolone or two shots of NPH is good enough. Long acting, which is the drug of choice in, in uh, COVID, if you give dexamethasone, you see this, it has a long protracted action and probably a long acting basal analog would be a better option. And this is what the guideline tells us clearly, beautifully, this particular data. You see here, short acting in, uh, uh, steroid, rapid acting insulin analogs, intermediate acting steroid, you can give them NPH once or twice or thrice daily, and you have a slow peak and, and a long uh, you know, duration like a dexamethasone, you can use glazine, detamer, or even placebo, or even uh, U300 glazine. So to conclude, insulin is the most important anti-hyperglycemic medication for management of hyperglycemia, especially in COVID times, so both in outpatient department as well as in hospital. Outdoor glycemic control should be intensified, not, not necessarily with insulin, even if with oral drugs, if possible. If not, definitely we should not waste time or procrastinate while initiating insulin. It should be as proactive as possible as a pre preventive strategy. Indoor management hinges primarily on basal bolus regime. And uh, to reduce the glucose fluctuations, second gener uh, generation analogs can be preferred, especially in those with high risk of hypoglycemia, especially those with organ dysfunction in the backdrop. And steroid induced hypoglycemia needs a case based approach depending upon the type of steroids which you are using. We need to remember that. Thank you very much for your patient here.